students, principals, and teachers. My name is Bintel Powell. I am the CEO and founder of Bandit Publishing, and I, I want to you know, thank you for taking the time to listen to this video. I know your time is short. This is a very difficult time period that we're in. Uh, with COVID, I'm, I'm sure you, ladies and gentlemen, have a lot on your plate, so I don't want to waste your time. I want to make sure that this is as informative and impactful to what you're going through now as possible. So I, I'm just going to get right into it. Um, I once heard a educator say that all students, all high school students, regardless of their race or socioeconomic background are at risk and I, and I tend to agree with that um, this presentation means a lot to me because I was born in Brooklyn so I have a particular affinity to uh, to to the young people that your district serves and and with that we all know that I don't want to bore you guys but we all know that traditionally underserved students are at have higher risk factors in uh, in this country based on its history and based on what's currently going on the racial socioeconomic dynamic of of the United States of America puts black and brown children at a higher risk some sociologists and theologists even believe that econ uh, excuse me entrepreneurship is not a wish list education model for traditionally underserved students. They believe that it is a necessity as the trajectory and the difficulties that these students will face becoming gainfully employed, surviving in the corporate sector, especially in the technology arena of which I come from, is, is a lot more difficult than other, than other groups and ethnic groups. So um, to dovetail that, I come from the corporate world. I'm a sales engineer. My background is electrical engineering and computer technology. Uh, I did this for 30 years. And uh, some days I'd walk into the office and my manager would put a book on your desk and you know, politely tell you that if you don't read this book, you're not going to be employed at this company within 30 days. So it was sort of an indirect way of you know, giving you an ultimatum to read this book. And one of the books that I was forced to read was Dale Carnegie's Think and Grow Rich. The book is, uh, is, the, is the bedrock of all self-help books in corporate America. Anybody that's in corporate has read this book and been forced to read it. The basic thesis of the book states that if you want anyone to do anything for you, you have to show them that doing what you want them to do is going to get them what they want in life. And there is a superintendent in Brooklyn that I know uh, who says, you know, she says that as soon as she walks into the door of any one of her schools, the kids surround her immediately and say, you know, Mrs. Watts, please teach me how to be a boss. And that's what they want. Right. So that is what we intend to give them this book and this curriculum. We call it the formula. And it is that. And uh, the book is designed to teach students how to make a fully functioning corporation from scratch. Little do they know they're really using engineering tools to do this. We're secretly giving them engineering tools, best practices, and methodologies wrapped in an entrepreneurial packaging. They don't know this, though. All they know is that they're going to be the bosses that they so desperately desire to be because they're being hounded by the entertainment industry, people like Kanye West, and which makes your job a lot more difficult. And to engage them, sorry about that, to engage them, we, uh, we tell them that we're going to teach them how to make a money machine. E-STEM where the E stands for entrepreneurship. And our covenant, our the basis of our relationship with our students is that we promise them to teach them how to create technology as opposed to simply using it or, or barely understanding what it is. And 
it is also our thesis that there is a conspiracy afoot that is being purported on these young people, not just black and brown or traditionally underserved populations, but the, the working class poor throughout the country. This conspiracy, this is our thesis, my thesis, is that after working in corporate America for these people for 30 years, I, I know what they're capable of. And it is my thesis that there is a conspiracy between the Ivy League schools, the Fortune 500 companies of the country, and some very insidious lawyers in Washington called lobbyists to keep specific information away from the masses of, of young people. To make sure that the top 1% that control 90% of the world's wealth always stay in power and always are the ones to be able to own and create large multi-billion dollar international Fortune 500 companies. And the, this conspiracy is, is in two words. One is called a disruptive innovation and the other is called a unicorn company. And when we teach your students, traditionally underserved students, or students, any student that has never heard of these things, don't even know that these two things exist, they get extre extremely excited about education. Um, they, they, it is also said, as you know, that the best way, the best cure for at-risk behavior is a clear and discernible path to success. That last slide got a little cut off there, but what I was saying was that the best way to cure at-risk behavior is to provide students with a clear and discernible path to success that they believe they understand and they can follow. And our path is simply to teach students to invent a disruptive innovation and then turn it into a unicorn. Turn that disruptive innovation into a unicorn company by turning themselves and their product or products into a brand and then and selling that enough of that brand to take yourself to the IPO level. IPO stands for Initial public offering when your product and your company goes public and you become a billionaire in one day on the stock market. Quickly, a disruptive innovation is a product that comes out and destroys an industry. It, it, it does, it's, the word describes exactly what it does. It's mnemonic. It destroys an industry, disrupts an entire industry, and rebuilds a whole new one in its place. But it makes the creator of this disruptor a billionaire a few times over in the process. 99.9% .9 of the time, engineers create these disruptors. And once they create one or a few disruptors under the umbrella of their company, they take it and turn it into a unicorn. And a unicorn is basically something that's rare. And the, 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 the definition of a unicorn is that it's a company that's making a billion dollars in revenue every year. And there's levels to it. Bill, uh, unicorn and hexacorn is, I don't remember all of them. You can, I have the students look them up. I should know them by heart. But um, so Jim Bezos, who is the first trillionaire, incidentally an engineer, who is the founder of Amazon uh, is, you know, I mean, he's a, uh, his company is a unicorn a, a thousand times over and, and, you know, more than that. All right. That is the mentality of the Ivy League. This is only taught in the Ivy League. So when these students hear that all of these billionaire rock star founders and CEOs have dropped out of college, what they don't know what they're omitting to tell these kids that and these people have gone to Ivy League schools and dropped out like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs is that they have these unicorns already built before they drop out. 
They have disruptors that they've already created. And they have the unicorn companies already built before they drop out. All right. I, working as a sales engineer, someone who was an engineer, as I said before, and a salesperson, prototypically, unbeknownst to me, too, they did this to me, too, was, was given the tools to create a disruptor in a unicorn. It's just that Northeastern University, the school that I went to, purposefully didn't tell me how to use it to do this. And the reason they don't tell you And the reason they're not telling our kids is because CEOs hate competition. And they've instructed through lobbyists, do not produce employees for us. Make this technology stuff so hard and so insidious that the kids, after they graduate, they don't want to, they don't even want to be involved with it. And if, and if you, if they do survive it, because Northeastern had an 80% dropout rate, Make sure that you just tell them enough to be our employee so that if they do create a disruptive innovation, we can cannibalize it and take it as our own. But don't you dare make competition for us. And that is where the rubber is meeting the road. The kids today, because of rap music, they're dropping out. They don't want to hear this. They don't, they're, they're not engaged in academics because they believe that going to school and making money have nothing to do with each other. The kids at the Ivy League schools believe in education because their fathers and mothers are the C-level employees of these companies that have instructed the, the, the government and the lobbyists not to tell our kids how to create these things. That's why I'm here. So when, when these young people find out what's going on and when they start to hear what we're teaching them in the classroom, on television, and all around them, that they had no idea even exists, they focus. Because as I said before, what they want to do is they want to be a boss. They don't want a job. They've seen their parents with jobs and they've seen their parents get beat up by the corporate world and they've realized because the rappers and athletes are telling them at a constant rate of speed be a boss. You got to be the owner of your company. The rappers are in their ears. The rappers are entrepreneurs. Extra- rappers and Jay-Z and Beyonce have made the word, the term CEO, such a popular catchphrase now that it's never, it's never going to go away. It's only going to get worse. So Uber is a disruptor. Amazon is a disruptor. Elon Musk is a disruptor. Um, the godfather of entrepreneurship, Steve Jobs, all right, he disrupted, how did he know that we were going to need an iPad, right, that, I mean, all of these disruptors, Uh, the gentleman who invented Napster, I don't know if you guys remember Napster, he went to Northeastern, uh, my school, disrupted the entire music industry, burnt Tower Records down, turned it upside down on its head, Netflix is a disruptor, this is the North Star of the Ivy League, all right, once our stu- and we, the tools that I'm going to show you are designed to create disruptors. And, and again, they did this to me. It wasn't until I was out in the corporate world and I was responsible for selling the technology to other companies that I realized why Northeastern had put me through so much torture with all these formulas and math, but they never told me how to use it. It's bas- ba- they basically gave me a Lamborghini but didn't show me how to turn it on. And that angered me. And that's what's driving me to do this. And my wife uh, was an English teacher and I used to write her lesson plans and that's sort of how I got involved in tech education. Because nothing is going to change. Unless we teach black and brown or all kids, since this is supposed to be a democracy, education, excuse me, um, the dropout crisis will continue and we all know what happens with property values and crime and drugs and goes up. I don't want to bore you, you, you ladies and gentlemen understand that. We have to give the children a more compelling argument than just being a rapper or an athlete. The rappers and athletes make 
hundreds of millions of dollars, the technology disruptors make billions. Now, some of you, ladies and gentlemen, may be saying, well, I already have a STEM program and I already have an engineering program. I have P-Tech. I have Project Lead the Way or I'm teaching robotics in my, in my school, which is, which is great. I'm not here to you know, beat those education models up. Um, they're, they're a really good start. But I, I can't tell you that how many, how many black and brown children have come to me in, in, uh, in confidence and told me that they're in P-TECH programs and they don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand why they're doing it and that if it wasn't for their parents, they would have dropped out of it. They don't want to be involved in it anymore. Um, Robotics is, is, you know, is cool because there's a little computer programming in there. Um, but eSTEM, the notion of inventing technology and understanding how to take, because technology is not about playing with tech. That's about being, that's being a technician. And that's what a lot of engineering programs set engineers up to do, unbeknownst to them. Technology innovates faster than any other industry because of logic tech technology is innovation if you're not creating technology if you're not studying and creating technology and i don't mean to be a you know a a a debbie downer the reality is you're being set up to be a technician engineers invent they create technology technicians fix the technology that engineers make. So if no one is telling you how to create technology, they are doing you a huge disservice. And what I've found in in the last 15 years that I've been teaching this is that when you examine the way technology is taught at the Ivy League and compare that to way to the way technology is taught at all of the other colleges, the Ivy League professors talk to the students in terms of inventing new technology. They literally tell the kids about their friends who work for major technology companies and how many how they become hundred million dollar technologists because they figured out a way to embed silicone in the the, the, the computer chips and how and how the companies use electrical engineers and chemical engineers to design. They talk to them in a completely different manner. And this is not just me saying this. When I was at Northeastern, I had a professor named Professor White. He was teaching us African-American studies, which I also believe every African or minority kid, black and brown kid, needs to understand the context of America to understand what they're involved in. And it was him who put this bug in my ear because he taught at Harvard University that summer. And he came back and he said to us, and I quote, the only difference between the education at Harvard and the education at Northeastern was he said, and these were his words, at Harvard, they tell you when you become the CEO of American Express. And at Northeastern, they tell you when you get a job at American Express. It is basically set up, designed. These schools are designed to produce presidents and CEOs. While all the rest of us, all the rest of us are designated to work for them. And the, and the North Star of this is this notion of a disruptive innovation and a unicorn company. And that is why the P-TECH programs only attract a certain small group of students. But if you want the masses of your students to be technology savvy and come out with an Ivy League mentality, then if you have to give them something like this. If not my program, something like this. And to my knowledge, there is there are, the, the notion of e-STEM, entrepreneurship and STEM is only being taught overseas and in a few very small colleges. Bandit Publishing has been pioneering this for the last 14 years, and I can tell you it has never failed. It has never not worked. 
Never, never, ever, never, never, ever, never once. The only risk factor is that we, if, if the schools don't put the resources into it to train the teachers properly to support the teachers, that is the only risk factor. But as far as the kids are concerned, the kids will cheer like they're in a football game because this is what they want. They've been dying for this for the long... I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but um, that is the difference between P-Tech and robotics and, uh, and Project Lead the Way is that it doesn't give innovation context to the technology that it's teaching the students. That's the difference. Give you, ladies and gentlemen, a glimpse under the hood these are our engineering instruments, our tools. And it is our thesis, it is my thesis, that no matter what strand of engineering you may be studying, whether it be electrical or biomedical or chemical or, or mechanical, the gentleman that's teaching this program right now in Chicago is a mechanical engineer, and he, um, he's taught P-TECH, and he's, he's taught... Um, uh, project lead the way. Sometimes he, he sends me a project lead the way lesson plan and says, let's try it like this. And I'll say, no, 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 no. Calm down, Mr. O'Brien. Let's do it my way. And then he'll call me, he'll send me an email later and say, wow, it actually worked. I tried to do that and it didn't work and it actually worked. So, and you know, this gentleman, he's, he's willing to speak to you, ladies and gentlemen, anytime you want, but any form of, basically these are universal engineering tools. And Every engineering discipline has these instruments in, in it, all right? If you see to the bottom, what they don't tell you is that logic statements, those logic statements train you to think like an innovator. They don't tell you this. They just test you on it at Northeast. They just tested us on it at Northeastern, but they didn't tell us, hey, this is what you're going to take to come up with the ideas that are going to make you the next Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. So sorry about that. Thought I turned that phone off. Um, they don't tell you. They purposefully didn't tell us. They just tested us on and tried to fail us. To the upper left-hand corner is the value meter. Critically important. Life in the corporate world is about inventing, discovering, and selling value. It is literally impossible to do that if you have no idea of what value is. Value add, value system value proposition, um, all these terms are the bedrock and cornerstone of any corporation, yet no one knows what they mean. The only people that know what they mean are the salespeople. And the only reason that I know it is because they trained me on it because I was their hired hitman. I was their hired technical gun. So unless you train unless you know what value is as i said before it's going to be impossible for you to create it sell it or invent it and that is what our kids do so that to the upper left hand corner it's there's something called units of measure that's what we that's how we teach unit of measure in uh, in our in our engineering class and then the logic statement which is used to reverse engineer any innovation we, we have a model literacy, and you can't teach kids anything unless you give them an understanding of modeling, all right? Now, the problem a lot of you schools are having is that these rappers and athletes are role models for these kids, and they're wildly successful. But these rappers and athletes are exhibiting and demonstrating at-risk behavior, yet they're rich. So... How are you going to tell those kids not to imitate that behavior? You can't unless you explain to them and show them the context of what this is, what's happening and show them that this is just a CEO using certain behavior to sell you a product and they don't care if you end up in jail imitating that behavior. They don't care if you end up dead imitating that behavior. All they want you to do is buy their product, <clears throat> right? Once the kids hear it in this context and realize that this is a cruel trick being played on them, it stops them in their tracks. But you have to give them the tools to fight back. And then the formula, which is the, the mathematical equation in the middle, is simply 
a speedometer for how fast the company is moving. But it's also a linear mathematical equation. It's the bedrock of mathematical computation for other more complicated mathematical, like calculus and statistics. The, the Common Core talks about it. Uh, it was We got drilled on these linear mathematical equations at Northeastern. And, and if you see, there's a little V there in it. It, it dictates how fat the value of the three elements of the formula dictate how fast or slow the model spins and produces capital. So all of these tools here give your students the ability to create a unicorn, which is a company that's making a billion dollars based on the design and engineering of their model, and a disruptive innovation using engineering logic statements. Project Lead the Way is not going to tell you that. The P-TECH program is not going to tell you that. And neither is robotics. Um, they're, they're, it's just not part of their lexicon. It's not part of their strategy. The only place you're ever, ever going to be able to find out how these tools are used to create disruption and, and, and innovation is in an e-STEM program. And to my knowledge, we're the only ones that are doing that. We, we are the pioneer in this, in this genre of STEM. So in conclusion, our goal and our methodology is to turn your students into a scientist, an engineer, and a salesperson all in one super entrepreneurial, technology savvy, rock star, billionaire entrepreneur. If I, if I, I hope I didn't say entrepreneur twice. All right. And all entrepreneurs, all of the top entrepreneurs that are billionaires, whether it's Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or, um, well, not, not even, you know, the billionaires, but um, George Washington Carver, um, Miles Davis, any great innovator, even Muhammad Ali, they all have the ability to discover like a scientist, innovate like an engineer, and sell themselves throughout the world like a rock star salesperson. And that's, we drill the students with this in our, in our program. So the students now come out with an appreciation for science as a discipline, engineering as a discipline, as well as sales. And we tell them that their, their rise to power will be their ability to not just sell a product and discover value in a product and engineer it, but that they are a product themselves and their behavior, their image is front and center. So if they drop out of school, that's, that devalues them as a product. If their behavior is at risk, that devalues them as a product. So at that point, whether they like me or not, whether they like the teacher, whether they like the principal, they, they're there, their own self-interest has to take over and say, logically, if I want to make money, I have to do this. I have to do this. In the, in the, in the words of, of Dale Carnegie, if we want them to stay in school and study and apply themselves and put the cell phones down and stop with the TikTok and the Instagram, we have to show them that doing what we want them to do is going to get them what they want in life. And I don't know any other way to do that than through entrepreneurship and technology. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this product is not just something that can be applied to technology. It can be applied to fashion, to basket weaving, to sports, to entertainment to technology, any industry, it is you called ubiquitous to any industry. It's plug and play, which opens up the world of industry, the stock market, investment, writing, the kids write business plans, they invest in the stock market, they reverse engineer other people's products, they do case studies, in addition to innovating new products on their own, like they're in the Shark Tank. So, I mean... I, I, I hope I wasn't too long-winded. Um, this may be a little fantastical. If you'd like to figure it, because and as I said before, the kids have to sell themselves. And I, if you'd like to find out 
a little bit more about me. The last four slides go into sort of my bio as to how I discovered, <coughs> excuse me, discovered this formula. And if you if you're interested, you can listen to that part, and it'll hopefully it'll give you a little more trust in the fact that this is real. Um, and I, and I hope that you will at least allow us to present this to you myself and the teacher in Chicago who's teaching it now. He can give you his he, you know his his take on how the kids are reacting to it. But uh, I just want to close by saying that this has never not worked. Never, never once. The uh, the the only issue I'm having is that I haven't been able to talk to you people, the principals and teachers in this fashion in the last 14 years I've been doing it. I've been doing it as an after school program, but it's something that you can use as an elective class to replace a science class or a math class. If you're having kids that you need them to get out to, to you know, get them, help them graduate or to sort of get the the more at risk students more to re-engage them back into the academic process. There's there's a number of applications for it. Um, I, I thank you so much for listening. Please, if you want to hear, a, a, you know, the rest of the rest of this presentation is a little more entertaining. If you want to listen to that, be my guest, and I am available and ready and willing to answer any of your questions or concerns. I, I hope that this inspires you to at least inquire more, and I, I sincerely look forward to working with all of you esteemed educators in, in the very short term. Take care, God bless, and be safe. My search for the formula began 25 years ago studying to be an electrical engineer. One day in my junior year at Northeastern University, trying to get close to a girl, I skipped a circuits class and followed her into her business class, hoping she would go on a date with me. As I sat next to her, listening and watching her professor, I saw him use the exact same formula my professor used to calculate current in an electrical circuit to calculate inflation in a country. Same shape and structure, just different variables and numbers. It sent chills through me. I sat there, watching, stunned. There was much more to this education thing than I originally thought. I wanted to scream to the entire class, these professors are purposefully withholding information from us. There was obviously a conspiracy afoot. Why wouldn't they disclose to us the power of math to be used to solve problems in completely different industries, much less situations? That's when I fell in love with learning and realized there had to be a formula for making money. I had to find it. When I found it, I'd be loud about it and tell everyone. I had no time for anything else but my studies, including that girl. My grades went from C's and D's to A's and B's. It was the turning point in my education and would not have happened had I not played hooky from class that day, proving education is three parts information and seven parts exposure. And the best education is indeed travel. I was getting close to finding it. After graduating with my engineering degree, I came home and looked in the New York Times for a high paying engineering job. To my surprise, I saw the high-paying jobs were not for the engineers, they were for the salespeople. I was stunned. There was no sales major in college, yet and still, here it was. I shifted gears immediately to sales. My engineering degree instantly meant nothing to me. Money, as is the case with today's youth, became my only motivation. I landed a job as a sales engineer designing and selling computer systems to Fortune 500 company CEOs in Manhattan. I felt it was the best of both worlds. Little did I know, this job was leading me directly to the formula. Meeting with some of the most powerful CEOs in Manhattan to make their companies produce money in less time using less energy, I learned that all companies, no matter what the name, were made of only two parts. The part that engineered the product and the part that sold those same products. I learned that salespeople made more money than all other professions combined and were statistically more likely to become the CEOs of their own companies than all other professionals combined. Soon it dawned on me that as a sales engineer, someone like me was prototypically a company unto him or herself. The more I investigated this sales engineering dynamic, the more I realized just how powerful this combination of engineer versus salesperson actually was. Unlike most nerdy engineers, I was lucky enough to have access to a very healthy social life. By day, I was a suit and tie corporate nerd sales engineer. By night, 
care of some high school friends who'd risen to power in the entertainment industry, I was mingling in VIP sections with the most popular and beloved celebrities in the world. Unlike all the actors, actresses, rappers, athletes, and models who waltzed freely in and out of these exclusive clubs in their VIP sections, I was not some B-list athlete. I was a nerdy engineer who was just lucky enough to have friends whose companies sold their image throughout the world. I spent every dime of whatever commission I made chasing VIP parties across the country trying to keep up with these mega wealthy people. As they socialized, I studied their behavior, convinced I was too close to their success for it not to somehow rub off on me. My thinking was, if I watched them closely, I'd find my formula for success amongst their empty champagne bottles. These high school friends had a plush ad agency office right in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. So when I wasn't meeting with CEOs selling my computer systems, I was hanging out in their office, mingling with their clients and watching them sell advertising to TV networks across the globe. I had a front row seat to the entire show. Slowly, watching what they were doing, as any scientist would, selling not only advertising, but the celebrities we partied with, I realized that these celebrities that they worked with and for had the exact same behavior as the companies and the CEOs I was meeting with during the day. They were all sales engineers, just like me. Same behavior, different product. It flashed me back to that day in college when that slick-talking econ professor used my engineering formulas to calculate inflation. The actors were the best sales engineers of all of us. Instead of engineering computer networks and selling them to companies, they were re-engineering themselves and selling themselves to the world in various movie roles for hundreds of millions of dollars in residual income. Once I realized what was going on and how similar we were, I felt so close to finding the formula, I could practically taste it. Energized by my discovery in the entertainment industry, I continued to investigate this secret sales engineer syndrome. One by one, they all checked out. My research proved that every rock star billionaire technology CEO, just like the people in the entertainment industry, had two things in common. They could all engineer an amazing product and they could all sell that product throughout the world. The only difference was the entertainment industry people made hundreds of millions, where the technology CEOs made billions. Barring that, each and every single one of these tech mavericks possessed both of these two priceless qualities, and if I was lucky, working as a sales engineer for them, maybe I did too. That's when I finally embraced the fact that I was a sales engineer and stopped modeling myself completely after rappers and athletes. After a lot of heartbreak and failure, mixed in with a few monstrously large computer networking deals, which made my employers millions and earned my wife and I a few all-expense paid vacations to places like Monte Carlo, the world's playground for the mega wealthy, the formula finally reached out and slapped me across the face. When I failed, it was always the same three things. When I was successful, it was always the same three things. And it was now too obvious not to notice. After 20 years of doing the same job, I knew more about the computer systems than even the engineers making their individual parts. When customers listened to me hurl information at them about all I knew and how I could save their day, they would quietly say, okay, Bintel, what do we do now? They saw me as a partner or a coworker because I was shining light on how my computer designs would make their lives heavenly. I was either relaying this information to them directly or to a small army of other salespeople who would sell my computer systems for me, making my job a breeze. Soon, the pattern of behavior was like a blinking red light. I'd finally found the formula. The information I gave my customers, the computer systems I was designing and selling, and the relationships that helped me sell or purchase the computer networks from me directly were the three elements of the formula. That was it. In those three elements lie the power to turn everyone, even children, into fully blown sales engineers and show the world that everyone that was successful, including the celebrities I was once so entranced by, were behaving in essentially this way. It took me 25 years, but I did it. At last, I'd found it. I started using it to run circles around all the other salespeople in my office, including my boss. Excited? I wanted to tell everyone. I was certain I knew something nobody else did. I was wrong. 
The CEOs that I was meeting with all knew it too. Once I started lightly talking to them about it, I realized it was common knowledge to them. So common, they were teaching it to their children and of all places their homes, specifically at their dinner tables. It was like their own private built-in family success school. They were giving their kids this secret, ensuring this information that took me years to find would secretly stay in their families for generations to come. That's when I knew I had to blow the whistle. That is why I am telling you this now.